Um, so I'm Nick Diakopoulos. I'm a research fellow uh, at the Tau Center for Digital Journalism here in the J School. Um, and part of my role uh, for the last six months uh, working here has been to develop this event series in computational journalism, which you're attending tonight. Um, the goal of this series is really about building community uh, on campus and off um, by bringing established uh, computing and information science uh, researchers uh, into the J School to talk about uh, their disciplines in particular and, and uh, how their disciplines can inform sort of the, the use and development of technology and journalism. Uh, so thanks again for coming out. Um, tonight we're talking about uh, computational thinking, uh, an approach for problem solving that incorporates various concepts from computer science. Um, and alongside things like design thinking, it's sort of one of the, the core liter literacies that we think are, are going to be important for students and practitioners of journalism in the future. So to educate us about uh, on what computational thinking is and what it can offer journalism, um, tonight we have joining us um, Jeanette Wing. Um, some some uh, may call her the godmother of computational thinking. Uh, we're very lucky to have her here tonight. Um, she, Jeanette is a corporate vice president of Microsoft Research, where she oversees the organization's um, many uh, research labs, but, uh, both uh, in the US and, and internationally. Um, before that, she held a prominent position in the government at the NSF, the National Science Foundation, directing the Computer and Information Science and Engineering Directorate. Um, and before that, she was a, a professor and the department head of computer science at Carnegie Mellon. Um, in 2006, uh, Dr. Wing wrote an, a very influential paper uh, about computational thinking, uh, uh, which, to the best of my knowledge, uh, was really what started and, and sort of kicked off the diffusion and the adoption of the idea um, into educational curricula um, uh, throughout the world. Uh, so Jeanette's going to come up in a minute and, and uh, give, give us a lecture. And then she'll be joined by Mark Hansen, who's uh, hiding out here in the second row back. Um, many of you know Mark as a professor and director of the Brown uh, Institute for Media Innovation here at the J School. Uh, he came to Columbia a statistician and artist and has since been working uh, quite hard to update the curriculum um, at the J School to incorporate more computational skills, uh, including the soon to launch program um, called Year Zero, which aims to introduce core computing and data science concepts in the context of practice. So having said all that, uh, welcome again. And without any further delay, um, I present Jeanette Wing. Thank you very much for that introduction. I want to tell the audience that I'm actually very delighted to be here at Columbia. Um, my whole family is a Columbia family. I was a black sheep. Uh, unfortunately, I did not go to Columbia, but my father was a professor here, my brother went here, my nephew went here, my sister-in-law went to Barnard, and my mother even took courses here. Um, I did take a course here on campus once, uh, but I didn't get any degrees from here. So anyway, I, I, I grew up in, um, at the steps of the alma mater playing as a little girl. So I really um, love coming back to campus. And um, so thank you for inviting me. OK, so I'm going to talk about computational thinking. And let me start with my grand vision that is a bit audacious. And that is computational thinking will be a fundamental skill used by everyone in the world by the middle of the 21st century. And by fundamental, I mean as fundamental as reading, writing, and arithmetic. So this is a grand vision. Uh, I don't know if it'll come true or not, but this is kind of the big picture. And of course, it's an incestuous vision in that it will be computers and computing that will en enable the spread of computational thinking. Now, what this vision implies is, is twofold. One, in terms of research. And this is partly why I wanted to come to talk to the School of Journalism as a professional uh, a sector in, in society. Um, how scientists and engineers, all, all the way from scientists and engineers to historians, artists, and journalists, will be using computational thinking to advance their own field. And I, from having already you know, gotten a hint of the computational journalism program and, and, and courses here, I believe, I like to believe, that I'm speaking to the converted. Now, it also has an implication with respect to education. And I will spend some time on this topic as uh, in terms of 
what this vision of computational thinking has with respect to not undergraduate education, uh, for instance, at Columbia, or graduate education, such as the program you might be in, but, un, uh, but K through 12 education. And this is really a, quite a challenge um, when you consider how K through 12 education is administered in a country like the United States. And this is the paper that um, was referred to. I, it's only three pages. It's very short. It's very easy to read. It's a bit poetic. Um, it's one of those papers that you can read right before you're going to bed. Uh, it's not deep in that, in that way. But uh, it, it did start a, a lot of people thinking about how to use computational thinking in their own discipline, how to uh, imagine teaching uh, computer science or computational thinking at the K-12 through 12 level. So before I start off on computational thinking and the benefits of computational thinking in all disciplines and the educational implications, I thought I should start first by sharing with you what I think of what computing is all about, um, because this is quite fundamental to understanding computational thinking. I'd like to talk about computing as the automation of abstractions. Now, automation is pretty uh, understandable. I mean, machines like this laptop, uh, devices, um, and anything mechanically, that's uh, uh, an automation as well. But it's the abstractions that are really uh, the novel part of computational thinking, or the important part of computational thinking. So I'm not going to focus on the automata below, which are actually executing and coming, making come alive the abstractions above. Um, but I, should, I do want to point out that when I talk about an automaton that might be operationalizing an abstraction, I mean not just machines. I want to include humans, too. And the reason is that there's a new kind of computer out there. And it's a computer that's a network of humans and machines. And we can talk more about that kind of computer in the discussion session. So computational thinking focuses on the process of abstraction. And the process of abstraction means first choosing the right abstractions. And then once you have, by definition, when you have an abstraction, you're really looking at a particular layer or system or object of interest and you're abstracting from it. That means immediately you have to, you're talking about two layers. And this process of abstraction means um, focusing on the uh, process of ignoring irrelevant detail at the bottom layer or the object below and focusing on the properties or the questions of interest at the top layer. The minute you start introducing layers, of course, it doesn't have to be one, two layers. It could be multiple layers. So the process of abstraction also means building these layers of abstraction. And th the reason one does that is to um, uh, handle the complexity of a large system, the complexity of, of many processes interacting with each other. So um, also the other thing that is once you have this kind of process of abstraction paradigm in mind, you can start talking very formally about the relationships between the layers. Um, because in the end, at least in computing, all the layers can, in the end, be mathematically defined. Okay, so all, all of what I just said about abstractions is absolutely not new to computer science or computational thinking. It's what mathematicians do all the time. Um, and other scientists and engineers use abstractions. They may not call it abstractions. They may call it modeling. Um, but they use these kinds of abstractions all the time. What in computer science that's a little different from, say, pure mathematics is the kinds of abstractions that we invent, we design, we define are guided by certain kinds of concerns. They're concerns of efficiency. So when you're designing an algorithm, for instance, you're always asking how fast is it going to take, um, how much storage is it going to use. And today, we ask questions about how much energy is it going to use. Uh, a new kind of property of measuring the goodness of an algorithm, for instance. We also are very concerned not just about efficiency of an abstraction, but correctness. We want a particular program, for instance, to do the right thing. Does the program actually compute the right answer? 
Um, it's no good if it computes something, but it's the wrong answer. We want to ask if it does anything at all. It might be fine that uh, you know, it doesn't do anything, but that's not very useful. So we want to, we might ask questions about, does eventually this property hold? Or does eventually we reach a certain state where a property holds? So those kinds of questions of efficiency and correctness are pretty fundamental to the ways in which a computer scientist might approach a problem and a solution to that problem, or might design a system and look at the design. And along with efficiency and correctness, Always, uh, computer scientists would ask, uh, uh, oh, try, strive for simplicity, elegance, scalability, usability, also all these illities in designing a system, or in uh, designing an algorithm, or in designing a data structure. Now, again, all of the ideas that I list on the slide here is not new to computer science. Any engineering discipline also follows these sorts of um, conditions or constraints or uh, rules of thumb to keep in mind when designing something. Uh, computer science is different um, in, in a fundamental way from other engineering disciplines. I'll get to that on my next slide. So computational thinking philosophically combines mathematical and engineering thinking. Computational thinking draws on mathematics as its foundations. Um, but unlike in mathematics, we are constrained by the physical um, physics of the underlying machine, be it a laptop like this or the human. Um, computational thinking draws in engineering since our systems interact with the real world. So uh, much like a bridge or a, a building is a, an engineered system that is in the real world, so are the computational systems that we invent. However, this is the difference between, say, computer science and engineering and other engineering disciplines. And the difference is software. So in software, you can do anything. You can invent virtual worlds that defy the laws of physics, that defy the laws of nature, because it's all in your head. It's all in your head, you encode it in a program, and all of a sudden the program makes your virtual world come alive. And so that's where, that's what I mean by in software you can do anything. And it's because of that, that it's in, in computer science or in software, um, that you are limited only by your creativity. Because you, it's, uh, it's up to you to invent whatever world you want and then encode it in a, piece of, in a piece of code or a piece of software. So that's one difference between, say, computer, computer science and engineering and, say, electrical engineering or mechanical engineering, where those other engineering disciplines really are constrained by the real world. Okay, so when I talk about computational thinking, I really mean the ideas and not the artifacts, uh, although I've been talking about software and hardware. Um, but it's the way in which we approach problems, um, even in daily life. And I do believe that it's for everyone, everywhere. So to be a little more concrete, here are some classes of computational abstractions that are examples of what I mean by abstractions. And now, I don't want to intimidate the audience in thinking that everyone needs to know everything on this list. But I do think that everyone can learn one or two of those kinds of abstractions and go a long way. And the other reason I am putting this list of uh, abstractions on, um, in front of you is to uh, distinguish between computational thinking and what others call computer literacy or plain old computer programming. I very much... Uh, mean computational thinking is not just learning how to use Excel and Word and, and other computational tools that, you know, for instance, Microsoft produces. Um, and I also don't want to equate computer science with computer programming. Uh, computer science offers a lot more than the ability to program a computer. And it's that which I mean uh, by computational thinking. Okay. So now let's talk about examples of computational thinking in other disciplines. And what I want to do is just a couple of um, uh, uh, examples uh, 
in different disciplines. And I'm going to start with one discipline that has been already influenced and affected by many different computational methods. So let me ask the audience, and the answer is not journalism, I don't think, yet. Um, but in 10 years, maybe I'll come back and the answer will be journalism. But let me ask the audience, what one discipline might I have in mind in uh, um, my asserting that this discipline has been influenced by many computational methods? What, yes. That's really close to the answer I'm looking for. Biology, yes, thank you. Uh, the lady who, in the back, oh there, okay. So, yes, um, and to me, there is one tipping point that occurred um, in biology where I felt the biologist, where I felt the, the computer scientist offered something that made the biologist stand up and pay attention to what computer science has to offer. Um, now, now, I know you're, I'm, I'm asking you to read my mind, but what one thing could that be? Yes, same lady. Close enough. <laughs> the, um, sh the shotgun algorithm that uh, expedited the sequencing of the human genome. So as you know, at the turn of the century, there were competing um, enterprises to sequence the human genome. And the one that used the algorithmic approach won out. Um, and that's all of a sudden, I believe, when the biology community turn to the computer science community and say, hey, maybe you have some interesting things to offer in terms of algorithmic approaches, in terms of also computer infrastructure approaches, um, and so on. And since then, I've certainly seen in many campuses where computer scientists would talk to biologists, you know, they'd start off this far apart. And over time, we have certainly seen uh, degree programs now at the bachelor's level and the PhD level in computational biology. So it's, it's a given. Um, so there are many different kinds of computational methods that have been used uh, with biologists um, and by biologists for advancing biology. And I've just listed in red here many different modeling techniques, language techniques, tools and so on that were invented by computer scientists that are now seeing some kind of role from small to major um, in biological research. What's common to all these models and languages is that, is that there are ways to represent the dynamic processes that are found in nature. Uh, now, when I put it that way, it's no wonder that computer science uh, has something to offer because in computer science we talk a lot about processes that interact with each other and we talk about processes that change the state of perhaps another process because of this interaction. And so it's again no wonder that there might be something in the modeling techniques and the languages used to describe the processes um, that can carry over to understanding biological processes. Now, to be honest, I think the word is still out where there's been a significant advance and discovery um, in biology by these modeling techniques. But uh, uh, progress continues to be made daily by the computer scientists working with the biologists. I want to give one example, uh, and I, this will be the most technical part of my presentation. It happens to be in my research area, so I just wanted to show it off a little bit. And it's called model checking. It is a kind of a technique that is used to model a process and to ask questions about that process. So in the, uh, it's a black box uh, technique, and the, the black box is called a model checker. The model checker has two inputs. One input is a description, it happens to be a finite state machine, description of the process you're interested in. And the second input is a property you're interested in asking about this process or the system. 
So you've got these two inputs, the finite state machine model M and a property usually written in some kind of formal logic, in this case a temporal logic. You literally push the button and you get out one of two answers. You get out the answer yes, every single behavior represented by this process satisfies that property. That is a very strong statement. It means it's a way to say nothing can go wrong. Or more likely, more often in practice, you get the answer no, but you get more than the answer no. You get a sample behavior which says, here's an example of where you go wrong. And this is very useful for debugging your design, very useful for debugging your uh, process description. It turns out that this black box technique can be used in the context of, for instance, biology. And skip that. Here's an example. Here is a state machine model of a single cell diabetes cancer um, model. And the, no, the nodes, the red and the blue and the purple nodes that you see there are uh, modeling proteins and lipids. And the arrows in between the nodes are modeling the actuation or the inhibition of the interaction between, say, a protein and a lipid. And this is modeling a single cell, including the proteins and lipids relevant to diabetes and to cancer. And the question you might ask, oh, by the way, uh, the, one of the beauties of this model checking technique is it can handle large state spaces. So for instance, this little diagram here represents two to the 49 states. Um, and the question you might ask posed in a logical formula like temporal logic are questions like, do diabetes risk factors influence the risk of cancer or cancer prognosis? The, the question here on the table is, how are diabetes and cancer correlated, related, uh, and you can, as, as a medical scientist, you might want to understand this relationship. So you can ask the, these kinds of questions and you can formalize these kinds of questions in this mathematics, and then you can push the button and you can start, what you get are example traces or behaviors through this single cell model that show or disprove the property, the question of interest. And so it's through this kind of technique that the authors of this article can say, can assert uh, statements like diabetic risk factors might not increase cancer risk in normal cells, but they will promote cell proliferation if the cell is in a precancerous or cancerous stage, blah, 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 blah. Uh, and so this is where, the reason I am giving you this example is this is what I would call a deep connection, a potentially deep connection between computer science and biology, or this is what I would say a deep use of computational thinking, because it's understanding these kind of formal modeling techniques and what they can do to transfer into a context that biologists really care about to discover new knowledge. Okay, so that was my example of one discipline influenced by many computational me methods, and I just explained in quite uh, elaborate detail one of those methods called model checking. But let me flip it around. Let me ask what one computational method has influenced many disciplines? I know you know the answer to this. Binary thinking, that's a little too low level for what I'm looking for. That's a good answer, but not what I'm looking for. Machine learning, someone heard my talk before. <laughs> Machine learning, thank you, whoever that was. Um, to, in my mind has transformed the field of statistics. And I speak a little parochially here 
At Carnegie Mellon University, we have a school of computer science, and within the school of computer science, believe it or not, we have a machine learning department. And the machine learning department is made up of faculty from computer science and statistics. And the honest name of that department is statistical machine learning. And I know that all the faculty in the machine learning department who are statisticians um, have been greatly influenced by the advent of machine learning algorithms. Um, now, today, um, my use of machine learning is a little technical. What people in the media today um, call machine learning and the use of machine learning today is big data. So I'm sure many of you he have heard of big data. The um, fundamental advance in computer science that's going to make a difference to big data is machine learning. So machine learning in the sciences, it's a given. In astronomy, machine learning has been used to discover um, brown dwarfs and fossil galaxies. Uh, machine learning is used in medicine uh, for detecting patterns. Machine learning is used in meteorolo meteorology in a tornado formation. Uh, machine learning is used in neurosciences. Here is an example where many, many scans of your brain, these are the fMRI scans, are used, for instance, to understand language. What parts of the brain light up when you're reading a noun versus a verb, or this kind of adjective versus that kind of adjective? And so there's uh, active uh, research in this area. Machine learning is, of course, used everywhere beyond science and engineering. Machine learning is used to detect credit card fraud. It's been used, you know this, as well as I do on, on Wall Street, for good or bad. Um, machine learning is used in supermarkets to spit out those coupons you get, um, those personalized coupons you get when, after you scan your groceries. Machine learning is used routinely for recommendation systems, reputation services, and so on. Uh, machine learning is even used in sports. Coaches have been use, using train, uh, uh, videos and, and so on as training uh, uh, for their um, athletes. So I want to give a very simple example of a typical machine learning problem to, uh, to kind of convey to you how uh, transformative this technique is and how it addresses this big data um, proliferation of big data that we all also enjoy. Um, this is a, uh, a, a bunch of pictures. I, I, uh, and some of them are faces, and some of them are not faces. And the question on the table is, can I find the function that will separate the faces from the non-faces? A different, a, a little um, informal way of putting it is, can, can I find that dotted line that will separate the faces from the non-faces? And basically, I want a classifier that will, when given a new image, will say, oh, it's a face, versus it's not a face. So I'm going to abstract from this problem, and I'm going to ask the same question of, can I find the separator between the blue dots and the red dots? Um, and uh, the, the um, question is, when a new dot comes along, is it blue or red? And of course, in real life, the blue and red dots are not so visually uh, separable. Um, and what I might be looking for is not a straight line, but a curve or a shape in an n-dimensional space. And uh, you'll also notice that I'm willing to get some dots wrong. So it's OK if every now and then a red dot gets misclassified as a blue or a blue dot gets misclassified as a red. I will tolerate that an inaccuracy. So all of these uh, functions can be approximate in that sense. And so it turns out that a very famous computer scientist asked the question, can a set of weak learners create a single strong one? What that means is if I have a classifier that gets a lot of the points wrong a lot of the times, that's what a weak learner is, um, can I still build a strong classifier, one that doesn't get a lot of points wrong, um, out of the weak learners. And this was actually posed as a mathematical question, and the answer is yes. 
And a whole class of algorithms called boosting algorithms um, started uh, again in, in the 1999 era. And I want to give you a sense of what boosting is. Boosting is used just routinely for, for many machine learning applications. So here I've changed the dots into blue crosses and red dashes just to emphasize visually the differences. I might first choose any old classifier that separates the, the blue crosses from the red dashes. And you'll see I got three blue crosses wrong. So what I'm going to do is boost their weight and iterate this process. So I choose yet another weak classifier where I get the three dashes wrong and boost their weight. And let me iterate one more time. I get two blue crosses wrong and one red dash wrong. And I have three weak classifiers. And you know what the punchline is going to be. I combine these three weak classifiers and get a perfect strong classifier. So this was an example of what the mathematics pr proved out. Um, and this is an example of how the boosting algorithm works in a training and classifier. So as I mentioned, boosting is used in everywhere from all the applications I mentioned before, like recommendation systems and reputation services, but also for, for instance, detecting um, uh, tumor cells in mammograms. So everything from you know, mundane daily use to important medical uses. So I argued already that in one discipline, um, many computational methods have already influenced it. And the flip of that, which is one computational method has influenced many disciplines. Let me walk through very, very quickly other uh, examples of computational thinking in the sciences and beyond. So in other sciences, uh, computational thinking has been used actually for decades in chemistry. Um, in physics, one of my favorite examples is in physics recently, um, when I was giving this talk, uh, someone, a, a computer, a theoretical computer scientist who works with quantum physicists at MIT said to me, oh, I have a favorite computational thinking story for you, Jeanette. And the I, idea here was, in adiabatic quantum computing, there's a way of um, posing the problem you're trying to solve in some kind of a structure, um, and then transforming that structure into a, uh, basically a, an equivalent structure where you can read off the answer. And the physicists knew how to um, pose this problem in this structure, read off the answer in this structure, and even they knew the process of how to convert one structure into the other. And you can even convert the c structures at the same time so that they um, meet in the middle, if you will. But the physicists never asked the question that the computer scientist asked them, which is, how fast does that convergence process happen? A very first question that a computer scientist would ask, which is about efficiency and correctness and so on, right? How fast does this happen? But the physicists had never ask that question. It's, a, it's much like mathematicians and perhaps physicists always ask about the existence of something, but not ask, can you construct an example that shows the existence of something? In any case, the, the computer scientist was very keen on knowing the answer to this, because if the answer were polynomially fast, he might have a hint at the p equals np problem, which is outstanding in computer science. And it turns out the question is, the answer is, they converge polynomially fast until a small window here where it is exponential. So he didn't quite get, um, and not surprisingly, get the answer that he perhaps was hoping for. In math and engineering, geosciences, computational thinking is used, have, has been used, as well as, um, you know, important computing infrastructure and tools. Beyond science and engineering, I would say one of the most exciting trends right now in computer science is the meeting of economists and computer scientists. And this, of course, has, is due largely to the advent of the IT industry, 
um, in advertising, in display ads, personalized ads that you, you, that you see all the time when you're searching in Google or Bing, uh, or when you're doing, uh, uh, buying a book on Amazon and, and someone's recommending some other book for you. Um, a lot of that has to do with economic theory applied to these computing problems. In law, um, uh, there's been some uh, interesting uh, work in computational thinking and law. Um, in healthcare, it's happening. There are programs now and research um, activity, whole research areas called algorithmic medicine um, and, and so on. Um, one of the uh, uh, work that I know is actually very uh, famous here at Columbia University is the work on uh, digital or computational archaeology. Um, there are similar projects uh, at Microsoft Research Asia uh, and also at Stanford. Um, the one that you've been waiting to hear about is journalism. <laughs> um, and I just realized that I should write Northwestern University, not Northeastern University there. That was my bad. Um, but we can talk more about this at the discussion session, but I do like to brag about how computational thinking has started to infect journalism um, and in all in good ways, I hope. Uh, and and uh, there is really a emerging area that I would say is digital journalism or computational journalism. Um, in the humanities, I am also seeing, mainly because of the big data, um, uh, interest. When I was at the National Science Foundation, the National Endowment for the Humanities and the counterparts at the UK and Canada came to me and they asked, you know, can we do a digging into data challenge together? You know, we would put money in and ask the historians and the uh, scholars in literature and um, all sorts of humanities to compete um, and do something interesting with the question, what could you do with a million books? And I, I looked at them, I said, a million books? What's a million books? Why not a billion books? To me, a million is not a very large number. Um, but then I realized that, of course, as a humanities scholar, if you read a book a, a day and you live 100 years, you're not going to read nearly uh, a million books. So imagine if you can access the content of a million books all at once and see trends that cross disciplines, you know, see trends that um, uh, have something to do with some historical event in Australia that has something to do with perhaps some linguistic change in Eastern Germany. Um, you can imagine asking questions that you couldn't ask before, and, and even better than that, you can imagine discovering new patterns or new trends um, without having even asked those questions. Okay, so to be very concrete, I like to give this example of computational thinking in daily life. Um, so this is literally me on the second day when I was at NSF getting my morning coffee at the cafeteria. And uh, the first thing I did was I picked up a cup and I put some milk in it. Then I put some coffee in, uh, put some sugar in, got my lid, then a napkin, and then I exited. So as a computational thinker, when I look at this coffee station, you know, what's the first thing I think of? I think first, before I even get there, is how inefficient, you know? And it's even worse if there's someone in your way and you're both trying to get coffee at the same time and I'm trying to get my lid when he's getting his cup. I mean, speak about clashes. So, now then, as a computational thinker, when I see the problem uh, by asking the question, then I ask, you know, what's a good way of thinking about solving this problem? And I answered in a very computer science-y, jargony term, pipelining, which is another way of a kind of optimization. And in fact, when I s looked at this, the coffee station, I said, well, I knew the coffee machine was bolted to the counter, as was a soda machine. And I said, what are the minimum stations I need to move in order to affect a pipeline? And then I said, well, that's actually not the most efficient pipeline. But I stopped thinking at that point because, you know, it's just co getting coffee after all. And so the answer is, now that you've had time to think about it, is all I need to do is move the lids over. And then I have this nice 
smooth pipeline, and it is not the most uh, efficient in terms of getting my coffee, but uh, it was the most efficient in terms of talking to the clerk at NSF and saying, you know, you just have to move the lids over and then you don't have these people in the way. And, and, and he's looking at me and so much for my influence at NSF in computational thinking. Uh, now, of course, I set you up for uh, how I really did uh, influence the thinking at NSF. While I was there, we put out a program called uh, Cyber Enabled Discovery and Innovation. By the time I left, it was a hundred million dollar budget request. We didn't get that much. It started out as a fifty million dollar pro uh, program. And this really was computational thinking for scientists and engineers. As what was so gratifying by this program was every single science and engineering directorate put money in, including the Office for Polar Programs. Um, and that's how much commitment and belief there was that computational thinking was going to start laying the foundations of new discovery in all science and engineering disciplines. And this is just an example of the different fields in just the first year that we put out the program um, that we gave awards to, um, and all using advances via computational thinking. Um, and many of them addressed grand societal challenges. I also was quite influential in the educational part of NSF. We put out a program by the time I left to develop competencies in computational thinking for K through 14. So that's K through 12 plus a couple years uh, in college. And this is for teachers and students. So now I, I'm going to turn to um, the computational thinking in education. And this, you know, in some sense to me, it's it's a given now, it's 2014 since my paper in 2006. I see computational thinking being picked up by many graduate programs, science and engineering certainly, but, but for instance now journalism. And I also see um, many, many changes on campuses, including Columbia, where there are now offerings to non-majors that teach the principles of computer science, not just computer programming. So I kind of think that we've, we've really made a lot of progress on the research front or the educational front that is from undergraduate level up. So to me, the real challenge that remains is the K through 12 level. And I really didn't mean to take this challenge on um, when I wrote my little paper, um, but I was encouraged by lots of people around me uh, and I used to say that, okay, well, I'll take the challenge on, but don't expect the change to happen in my lifetime. So I, th I, I thought I'd give myself a, a few decades. Um, and in, surprisingly to me, we've made tremendous progress in the past five years, I, I'd say, and I want to share that progress with you. So first of all, I started out by challenging the computer science community who know nothing about education. They like to think they do. Uh, they like to think they know about K through 12 education. But in, in reality, the conversation had to happen with computer scientists, education scientists, cognitive scientists, learning scientists, psychologists, and so on. Um, and the question is, what is an effective way to teach computational thinking or computer science to K through 12 students? And that meant what are the concepts that students can best learn when? What would you teach a kindergartner? What would you teach a seventh grader? And I leaned on um, mathematics as a way to think about it. In mathematics, we know by the age of five, children have a sense of number. They certainly, in fact, share this innate sense of of, of greater than. Um, other primates have this sense of greater than. So we know that numbers, uh, children are f uh, facile with numbers by age five. We know by age 12 they can learn algebra, so that's beyond arithmetic. And by 17 or 18 um, they can learn calculus, um, which is beyond just algebra and geometry and so on. So there are concepts that we know how to linearize, if you will, in mathematics so that you learn one concept based on concepts you've learned already. But the other thing is that this linearization of concepts learned um, reflects also the 
sophistication, the learning ability, the sophistication of the learning ability as a child grows up. So there are two things that computer scientists would have to figure out. What are those concepts? And then do, do the learning of these concepts kind of um, match um, the maturation of a child learning, uh, learning's ability. None of this computer scientists really know how to think about or talk about. And I posed this question around 2007, and I, I do think we are, we're making good progress. Okay, so at other colleges and universities, um, and you know, basically many, many campuses have changed their undergraduate curriculum to, to curricula to introduce new courses like principles of compu computational thinking. So this is kind of a given now. Um, uh, industry has been quite supportive from Microsoft to Google, um, and national efforts uh, start with a, um, an effort that, that I helped uh, fund when I was at the National Science Foundation um, to have the college board rethink the computer science advanced placement course and exam. And this is, I believe, going to be critical for changing the United States, in the United States, how K through 12 um, thinks about computer science. Right now, the computer science AP exam is about programming in Java, probably, right now. So it is primarily a programming course. And it misses the boat on a lot of the more fundamental concepts um, that computer science offers and computational thinking um, offers. Um, there's a, 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 an organization called CSTA, Computer Science Teachers Association, which has been very, very active in trying to incorporate the kinds of um, principles uh, in this uh, college board course in curricula around the country. The National Academies held two workshops, and even Congress has been very supportive of promoting computer science education. Um, internationally, I think my favorite exem exemplar is the uh, UK. And it started in 2009, which uh, was essentially an advisory committee to the Research Council that said computer science, computational thinking is influencing all disciplines. But more importantly, um, in January 2012, the British Royal Society published a report that basically said computational thinking offers insightful ways to view how information operates in many natural and engineered systems. Every child should have the opportunity to learn computing at school. In the UK, school, S-C-H-O-O-L, means K through 12. Um, and what is so heartening to me now is, uh, this is not on the slide, but the update on this is that starting, the Ministry of Education in the UK has now mandated starting fall 2014, this year, that every level, K through 12, will incorporate some aspects of computational thinking. And they actually have curricula designed for each of these levels. Um, and it, it's, it's just amazing that so much progress has been made so quickly. Now, you have to realize in the UK, it's the um, K through 12 system is uh, administered completely differently from the way it is in the US. In the US, it's all decentralized. There are 10,000 school districts in the United States. If you wanted to incorporate computer science in, at the K through 12 level in the United States, you'd have to go one by one to each of the 10,000 school districts and convince them you should think about offering computer science to your students. Uh, not just say at the high school level, we're talking about K through 12. In the UK, it's completely different. There's a Ministry of Education at the top. Ministry of Education says, thou shall do X, and X happens. And that's what's happened in the past two years. That's why they were able to, starting from 2012 with this report, to only fall 2014 to implementing the recommendations in that report. Now, there's a big gotcha in all of these efforts. Uh, and the big gotcha in all of these efforts is what I call the teacher training problem. Um, it's fine to mandate this, but someone's got to teach this. 
And so the reality of the situation is there aren't actually enough teachers trained um, to, who understand this material to teach this material. So there's a flurry of activity now, uh, certainly nationally at the UK, but also in the US on addressing that teacher training problem. Um, one of my favorite smaller examples is a program, a degree program in a university in Ireland um, on computational thinking. And they deliberately chose the word computational thinking uh, because they didn't, because other terms like digital literacy and so on get confounded. Even the term computer science gets confounded. Um, so this program is a combination of computer science, uh, mathematics, and philosophy, which I thought was very unique. Other international efforts, there's some movement in, in Europe, in different countries, different parts of Europe um, happening. Um, there's definitely activity in Asia. I was just in China last uh, November, October, uh, giving a talk to uh, uh, the computer science educators in China. They're, they are also st starting to incorporate computational thinking into the K through 12 curriculum. Um, Latin America is not quite there yet. They're starting to make noises. Um, and a, a personal favorite of mine is a student in Egypt who sent me an email message saying, I read your three page article. Um, I am a true believer. I started this blog on computational thinking in Egypt. I want to change all the education in Egypt to incorporate computational thinking. Will you help me? <laughs> uh, I, I felt you know, really touched by that, the passion of that student, that single student who, who really wanted to change his country. OK, and my three-page article was translated into Chinese and French. Um, and that closes my talk. I will just continue to ask all of you to help me spread computational thinking um, and help make computational thinking commonplace. Thank you. So you don't want to sit on these. <coughs> um, thank you for that. Um, uh, it was great to see Michael Kern's name yeah. up there, and I don't know this might have been the first time that boosting was mentioned in Pulitzer Hall, but I can say that I, my, the, my computing students will learn to bootstrap with abandon, so they're getting close to it. Um, so I have a, a couple questions, and then I thought we would open it up to the audience. There's a microphone over here, so if you have a question for Jeanette, at some point you can sort of meander over. Um, so <coughs> I'm a statistician by training, and I teach here in the J School. Um, and I have to be honest, <clears throat> most of my time has, here has been spent trying to figure out what I, what I can learn from the journalists. Um, I, I think it's really a question of numbers because the building has about 400 journalists in it and then there's me. Um, but what I've seen again and again is that the computing and data sciences have a lot to learn from the humanities, from the social sciences, from journalists, from designers, from artists and so on. And I recall one meeting at the Brown Institute when a couple of um, engineers we'd funded um, presented some work on an augmented reality storytelling uh, platform. And the first question came from a journalist right after they'd made their presentation. And the journalist was like, well, what about the ethics here of this augmented reality piece? And the engineer sort of scratched his head. And he's like, what ethical questions do I have to deal with here? I mean, I'm changing a person's point of view on the world in some way. What could possibly be wrong with that? Um, or with algorithms, we should certainly ask not only how long and how fast, but also who wins and who loses, because algorithms are regulating um, vast systems of power and control in our world. Or maybe you can think about sensor systems that are touching forests and cities and measuring climate or traffic or po um, population movements. Um, so in short, your, your paper from 2006, and I remember reading it in 2006, and it has been inspired certainly a lot of the work that we did back at UCLA. Um, you know, 2006, the year Twitter started, say, um, it looked out onto a particular technological terrain that we've seen, at the, and since then, we've seen so many products of computer science emerge that have real societal effects. So my question is, after that long lead up, um, how do you see computational thinking evolving over time? I mean, will, will 
once having moved into another discipline, will it start to integrate the lessons from that discipline, the values and ethics from that discipline? Will it always be sort of a broad base of mathematics or will it inherit something from sort of societal concerns? This is a, this is a great question. Um, let me rephrase that question um, to, to not focus so much about computational thinking, but how will computer science as a discipline mm -hmm. be influenced by other disciplines or, and or thinking like ethical ethics, and privacy, security, and so on, um, as computer scientists work with people in other disciplines. And I do think, I already see the, these kinds of influences um, in computer science in two ways. One is there are what I call societal grand challenges that no one discipline is going to solve alone. And in that camp, I put things like healthcare and energy and climate change and transportation. They're going, each of these societal grand challenges are going to, uh, are going to need to draw from multiple disciplines in order to really make progress. So from that point of view, computer scientists working alongside other disciplines will s surely see different points of view, different perspectives, and benefit. The second is, is a little more specific to the field itself, computer science, and how it is being influenced by other disciplines. My most concrete example is, of course, economics, where although I phrased it as computational thinking and economics, to be honest, the transfer of knowledge has been more from economics to computer science. Um, and um, I, that's just one example. The other example that's quite concrete is, you mentioned social science, for instance, um, design, uh, psychology. I see all of those kinds of uh, s uh, ways of studying, ways of doing science, ways of looking at the world um, as influencing computer science in the very a common area called human-computer interaction, which hardly speaks to the future of human-computer action, where we're going to be talking about natural user interfaces, we're going to be talking about devices that perhaps are embedded in you, or wearables that are just part of your normal daily life. All of these contraptions um, that we're going to be using on a daily basis, all this technology, if you will, are, are, going to be, are going to benefit from the design element, the, um, the psychological element. Uh, uh, and, and computer scientists, uh, they might think they know everything. They don't know very much about those disciplines. And they can very much benefit from what I'd say design thinking or, um, and, and so on. The question of ethics and privacy is a whole other a question we can address separately. Uh, in fact, my own research area these days is in privacy, so we can talk about that separately. And so do you see the, some of the, the teachings from those disciplines moving into computer science? Yes, so if I, I will be concrete. Um, and, and this, again, will sound a little parochial because I, um, I, I still have uh, my roots in Carnegie Mellon University where the School of Computer Science at Carnegie Mellon has a very broad uh, mission and if you look at the School of Computer Science, it has not just a computer science department, but it has a machine learning department, as I mentioned. It has a human-computer interaction department, robotics, uh, language technologies, and so on. Each of these other departments I just mentioned are constituted um, by faculty with PhDs in non-computer science fields. So in HCI, for instance, there are, it's a combination of design, psychology, and computer science. In language technologies, it's linguistics and computer science. In machine learning, I said already, is computer science and statistics. In the, uh, there's a software research um, department, which is computer science, public policy, which is where privacy and ethics come into play, and, and business. Um, and in robotics, it's computer science, mechanical engineering, electrical engineering. The point really is not so much of these different combinations, but that the school has a very broad view and multidisciplinary and a welcoming of different perspectives. Now, to be honest, Carnegie Mellon is a little mm -hmm. odd in this it's sense. A bit of an outlier. We do not way. see this as common practice at most campuses uh, in terms of computer science. I think Georgia Tech is an example. Mm -hmm. Cornell University has a very broad view of computing. Um, and then it's Carnegie Mellon has always had this broad view. Um, I think, for instance, at Columbia, 
You have um, now this new Data Science mm -hmm. Institute. You've got programs like this on campus, uh, the archaeology program I mentioned. So there's definitely, you know, the modern thinking, if you will, where computing or digital technology um, is already influencing the thinking. Um, the, the beauty of a campus like Columbia University is that um, you have these other disciplines uh, from philosophy, I assume you have a philosophy department, uh, to all the humanities and arts that can, you know, influence the computer scientists on campus in their way of thinking. And actually to follow up on, on sort of another question about feedback, sort of innovations like GIS, right, geographic information systems, started outside of computer science, right? They actually started with landscape architecture. So I'm wondering in that sort of back and forth, um, do you see sort of metaphors for data or for computing coming from those outside disciplines? Uh, and maybe this is really a question about, about the dominance of mathematics at the core of, of computer science or, or computational thinking. I, I was just curious about, about that. I have not thought about how other disciplines' data might influence um, the computer scientist's thinking per se. I still think right now with their stages with respect to big data and other disciplines and computer scientists coming together is more, I've got lots of data. You, you computer scientists, can help me discover new knowledge from this data please help. So it is still at that stage. I could imagine the next stage being um, more, uh, being deeper, both from the discovery of, you know, certainly I can see that a particular class of data, a new data set or a new kind of uh, type of data will require new uh, data analytics uh, algorithms from the computer scientists um, just by the nature sure. of the data or the scale of data or the kind of outliers um, that are inherent in any real data set. Right. And I think probably an example of that would be, as you mentioned, that, you know, <clears throat> why think about a million books, let's think about a billion. When you get to the digital humanities, what you find is, I, I think that, if I can represent this, um, that, you know, sort of artifacts, like, an, uh, an author's one particular novel is not the same as any other. There are certain important novels, certain places where their style changed. All of that somehow might get captured in metadata, perhaps, which almost flips the dominance of, you know, so the metadata becomes an extremely important component of it where it might not be as strong in, in other sorts of, of, of questions. So that might be a place where that kind of flip would, would happen. Right, and another um, point about data is there's been a lot of uh, talk about big data, but I think that it's not just big data. It's, there's another term that's been floating around which I quite like, which is artisanal data. And the point there is not, it's not a, about a lot of data, but it's about data that has a very special purpose. Um, or it could be a small amount of data that's very precious data. Um, and it, you could imagine in the arts and humanities having more of those kinds of artisanal data sets um, which would require novel uh, kinds of data analytics as opposed to just blast some machine, big machine learning algorithm on this big non-entity big data set. So that would be quite I intriguing, I think. And I think you're starting to see a little bit of that as, as people in the digital humanities, people in journalism, certainly people um, here in this school have started to, to build on their own, started to make things on their own, started to try out, inevitably you try out the first algorithm, the blasting, then you go, okay, that's not really telling me what I want, right. what happens next? That's and right. what I, what I, I guess what I was trying to get at at the, those feedback questions is sort of how does that feedback, you know, how does that knowledge and understanding feedback and influence computational thinking to make it a kind of two-way, uh, like a two-way evolving? Right, I think you know, the, the, the easy answer is of course, Whenever a new application uh, comes around, that application drives innovation in computer science, whether it's an, a new algorithm or a new data structure, or a new way of representing data and so on. Um, I think, but the, what's really behind your question is would there be a fundamentally new abstraction right. um, that had computer scientists hadn't thought about? 
I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't preclude that from happening. I don't know what it would be, but I think that's the excitement um, that one gets when working across disciplines. That's exactly yeah. right. Um, so, uh, so one more question, and then I think we'll open up to the audience. So if, so as we move to K through 12 and we bring computational thinking further on and people come up sort of more aware of how technology functions, more aware of um, the, you know, the, the, the core components behind computer science. What's, what's the end state? What does society look like 25 years from now when we're all, you know, everyone Robots. in the room here? Pardon? <laughs> Robots. <laughs> Robots. Or, I mean, what's the end state? I mean, are there problems that we that we don't run into anymore? Are there, or maybe because we're in the school of journalism, are there are there are there things that 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 just don't that aren't hard anymore? I, what I have watched, and I I'm not so old that I can speak. Oh, looking back all these decades, I've seen all this progress. But I have obviously watched the next generation a couple of times of next. Um, to see how technology, tech, tech savvy um, people are, how this technology, let's, let's put aside computational thinking, but just look at the technology, for good or bad, has already changed um, the way people's lives. The, the most fundamental is the way people communicate with each other. Uh, it, you know, it, I can even speak, you know, I remember when I first got DSL at home, that changed my life. That seems so passe now. You know, the, the next big change in my life was getting wireless at home. You know, that changed my life. Then you get one of these smartphones. That changed your life. Now, and I'm talking about only a few years in between those, right? <laughs> so I can hardly predict the future, but I do know that th these generations are very tech savvy they are going to, the, the IT industry continues to innovate at a breathtaking pace. We cannot anticipate, um, you know, the exponentials that we're actually riding on right now. Um, so in terms of what this next generation can do, um, because it is only limited by what's in your head with respect to what you can do in software and new devices that are coming out, I, life will be different. I know that. Uh, good or bad, uh, more complex, faster paced, I, you know, more laws, uh, I don't know. Nice. I, and to be clear, when you, when you use the term tech savvy, uh, uh, so, I, you know, I watch my partner's nephew who the, his parents say are, you know, is really good with computers, but what he's really good at is, is picking up other people's interfaces really fast, right? And doesn't really have the understanding to, to imagine that this interface could be any different, that this that he's actually working on a humanly constructed, humanly right. deliberated piece of software, right? right. So, when, but when you use the term tech savvy in this kind of end state, you're thinking about a person who can think critically about this piece, could maybe imagine it piece of technology, understanding it differently, right? I mean, right. it's a, it's a so, deeper sense of that So word. certainly now, when I say tech savvy, I mean people who are not afraid to use technology. Right. But in the end state, it's not just people who are not afraid to use technology, but actually understand the technology, how it came to be, and can devise, uh, design and devise their own new technology. That is quite a different world. Um, I mean. Imagine the day when everyone, I, I'm not saying this, this will happen, but imagine the day when everyone knows how to program a, a device. Uh, partly because it'll be easy to do it, partly because it'll be natural user interfaces. Um, and there, again, it's then only limited by human creativity, which is unfathomable. I mean, just. But, yeah. You know, we've been thinking about that a little bit in the J School about what. So toward that end state and toward that place where everyone programs, um, which uh, is, we have a group of my students, raise your hand, kids. Come on, there they are, they're, who are learning to do that. Um, <coughs> I wonder if you're gonna start to see, um, in the sense that, that, that programming languages embed certain kinds of abstractions, so, and certainly subject-specific 
right, or disciplinary specific programming languages embed abstractions. Would you expect to see more and more diversity in programming languages? Like, I'm hoping for a programming language built solely for journalists, right? Would we start to see that sort of thing happening? That's a great question. I can certainly see um, that as computational thinking starts pervading other disciplines, and we have instructors and educators and degree programs like uh, computational journalism or this will be a, a natural progression. Um, everyone will be uh, fluent and facile with programming as they are with mathematics. And um, yet there is going to be a discipline, body of knowledge or abstractions, concepts specific to that discipline that because you're facile with you know, uh, computational concepts, you'll just make explicit in a language uh, for uh, digital journalism programming or whatever you want to call it. Absolutely. I, uh, we already see this in, in science and engineering disciplines. Um, so why not imagine the same thing in humanities um, and arts and so on? Actually, that leads I, my promised last question. Um, that, that makes me wonder then the relationship with mathematics. You said as facile with this as with, a, with, with math. So is part of the end state a, a greater facility with mathematics as well? Right? Is, is, does that have to be at the, at the core of, of computing or with sufficient, uh, or are there core principles that might have computer science, parts of computer science perhaps not so tied to, to math and, and I would say it's, it's not so much mathematics as the, you know, let's say algebra, geometry, or calculus Perfect. and differential equation, uh, equ differential equations. But I would say it's the analytical thinking. It's a logical reasoning. It's symbolic reasoning, not just numeric reasoning. That's what you get from computational thinking. And after all, when you think about algebra and you know, 3x plus y equals 5z to the 3, you know, 3 and 5, these are, these are numbers over some algebraic structure. You know, these are actually X and Y. They're just symbols. And so you substitute whatever term expression you want for 3 and X, and all of a sudden it's just symbolic manipulation. And once you think of it as just symbols, then you can do so much with that because you can invent your own axioms and rules to manipulate those symbols. And it's far from the, math, the arithmetic we know. But why not? And in fact, we see this in, in, with the... Um, if you're familiar at all with the Computational Linguistics Olympiad, which is mind-boggling. If you ever look at these questions, they're, <laughs> they're impossible. <laughs> um, and it is, a lot of it is about uh, the deep understanding of linguistics as represented symbolically, so, and, man, and ma manipulating those. So I, you know, I, yes, it, 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 when I say mathematics, I think it's the analytical and logical symbolic reasoning I mean. That's beautiful. Thank you. Um, some questions from the audience? Hi. Uh, my name is Michael Rand, and I've been involved with teaching computer science since the 90s. <clears throat> and I was wondering if you could talk about, and I think there may even be a story here that someone here might want to report about, the human side of these changes you talked about. For example, I mean, here at at Columbia, you have Teachers College. They've had an entire department that's, in theory, dealing with you know the teaching of computer science in schools, and and yet and other stuffs going on. And yet we seem to have intractable problems, and or we seem to be facing the same issues again and again from then till now. So one issue is like this changing language routine. I mean, the AP Computer Science first it was Basic, then it was Pascal, C++. Uh, Java, and now it's changing to one of the web languages, some uh, Drupal, I think. Yes, it, for the next iteration. And, you know, it's like if, if you were teaching French and you said every five years, well, we're going to teach French by teaching Spanish, by teaching English, you know. It, so that's one issue. The other is uh, computer science is profitable, so it sucks out all the people that are really good and they become people like you working at Microsoft instead of people at you know, the K through 12 space. 
And I know that you know organizations have tried things, but I don't think they've worked. They haven't worked as far as I can tell. And I'm you know curious you could talk about that. And uh, and then also you know just within departments. Or it's here at Columbia we have the CS department. We have the people at TC. And sometimes people don't talk. There's balkanization and siloization. They don't talk to one another. And you mentioned some efforts in that, but I think we got a long way to go. And one other quick thing. I Israel, I'm just curious, you mentioned Egypt. I was just curious if anyone in Israel is also doing this and you could tell me who that is. Okay, so these are great points. Um, some of them are not specific to computer science, but I'm happy to address them because I think I've thought a lot about these issues. Let me speak about Israel first because I'm gonna forget, uh, if I, I'll probably forget all these questions. But yes, in fact, Israel has been one of the proponents of K through 12 uh, computer science education. Um, ever from the very beginning, so they have made great strides. Um, and there are various educators in, in the universities I can point you to if, in case you want to read their papers and about their work. Um, but one of the first question, um, the first question you asked about was teachers college and different programming languages and so on. Part of the issue with the different programming languages is, is simply a reflection of the field of computer science. Again, for good or bad, it, it is progress made in a field that happens to happen rapidly. And so to be on top of that field, you have to make changes rapidly. This is just the nature of computer science. It's just the nature of the field. Now, that's not to say that the field is completely unstable and it changes all the time. There are certainly core areas of computing, like algorithms and data structures, that um, are, are you, you can teach, and it will continue to have the same course material uh, now as it did 20 years ago, and it will 20 years hence. So um, it, it, programming languages is, is actually a, re, um, I, my, uh, research is in programming language, so there's a, it's a hot button for me. Uh, let me just say that, answer the question that, in that way. The question of um, balkanization is so common on almost every university campus I speak on. Uh, at, and, you know, one of, one of the um, advantages of having institutes and centers, institutes like the Data Sciences Institute, institute you have here um, and, and other kinds of centers I'm sure that you have on campus is to break down those barriers and get people in different disciplines to be working together and to start, a, to, to start appreciating different perspectives and different cultures. It takes the university, uh, it takes a culture in the university to promote that. Um, I have seen very siloed campuses and I've seen just the opposite where um, starting from the top, you really get encouragement for people to work together. Um, so, you know, it can happen at the department level, it can happen at the school level, it can happen at the university level. Um, it does take forward thinking, um, open minded uh, administrators, uh, faculty, and so on. What I have found is that, for the, at least the campuses that I know are very forward on this. What I have found that it's, it's usually the students who see the future and start demanding the changes. Um, the other thing I should mention is having had the vantage of the National Science Foundation, this was a topic we talked about all the time. Um, you know, the National Science Foundation, for instance, has a biology directorate and a geosciences directorate and an engineering directorate and computer science. And we used to talk about, how about we get rid of all our directorates? We just have one portal. All proposals come through that one portal. And somehow we'll find the right reviewers. Forget all these disciplines. And then we realized the National Science Foundation is organized to reflect academia's organization. So for us to change in that way would necessitate a conversation with the university to say, hey, maybe you guys are a little balkanized and siloed. So there's always, I don't have an answer to that, but I do see 
definitely universities and campuses changing in the dir direction to support more, more multidisciplinary efforts. Um, there was another question about why do people like me end up in like places like Microsoft or you know universities like Carnegie Mellon um, and not teaching high school where you know that's where people like me are really needed. That's uh, <laughs> Um, that is a definitely an, an issue for all of STEM education, not just computer science. And it's certainly a, a problem in computer science because um, most students are not exposed to computer science as a high school student, and so there's going to be less a le less likelihood that any old person can go back to high school and teach computer science, say, than any old person can go back to high school and teach uh, math or biology or chemistry or physics. Um, but maybe that will change as computer science is taught at the high school level, um, where more students, all the students, for instance, in this audience, will have been exposed to computer science as a young, as a young high school student. Um, and then the question is, completely you know, not related to the science or the technology, but the educational infrastructure that we have in this country, um, you know, paying teachers enough uh, and, 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 and so on. Also departmental fighting, in other words, schools, we have so much to teach, you want to ask us to teach a new subject? Right. I mean, that's a battle that yeah. computer science has been facing that's forever. Right. That's right. Yeah. So maybe we should take on I, I don't have easy answers to any of this. Are there particular disciplines that you're finding are resistant to computational thinking? And if so, why are they resistant to them? To the thinking, that is. Well, I haven't gone around giving this talk to lots of different um, disciplinary schools, like journalism and law and medicine and so on. Um, but everywhere I have given such a talk, um, I've always found a very supportive audience, and I, I think it's just been planted that way. There was one time, so, so the answer is I haven't found any discipline that's been resistant. Um, but I will share a, a story just to say that not everyone always is on board with my, my, my talk. And there was one time I gave a talk to a, um, a group of philosophers, this was in France, and so France and philosophy, um, it was way over my head. <laughs> I don't know why I was giving this talk to French philosophers, but they, they did not object to computational thinking, but they kept asking me, what do you mean by thinking? <laughs> I, just didn't know, even know where to start. I, 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 I kind of wanted to say, I don't mean this literally, but that's, to them, their foundation of existence. So I just was in, I had the wrong audience. <laughs> so, so to, you know, to, I do recall um, a lot of writing in the mid-90s in the GIS literature, the geography literature, um, about, well, here's this new computer tool that's plopped down in the middle of our discipline how do we think about this? What do we think about this? How does this change how we think about ourselves? And a lot of writing and a lot of, a lot of resistance and a lot of figuring out like how to live with, live with that and, and what it might mean and how to, how to meld values, I think. I think, in fact, the interesting resistance was very, in the very beginning from my own community, computer science, because they say, why are you inventing this term or using this term computer? computational thinking, you're just talking about principles of computer science, uh, which is true, and why don't you just lay out what those are? And, and there are um, people who are much more senior than I in the field who were annoyed with me because <laughs> I wrote papers like that. I just didn't call it computational thinking. Okay. <laughs> you know, but, but now I, I think there's been such momentum um, and, and embracing of the inspiration of the term that there's no s such debate anymore. And actually, there's a there's a there's a good a good book called Debates in the Digital Humanities, um, where there's some real discussion about what what bringing, you know, some of these ideas in in might might mean and, and how it changes how you reason and theorize. Um, so it's it's a it's it's a it's an active um, and interesting intersection to probe. 
Hi, uh, my name's Adam. I'm a PhD student in the sociology department here, and actually I'm going to be interning at MSR New York uh, this summer. Um, you have a very ambitious set of ideas. Thanks, thanks for presenting that. Um, I'm almost ready to be a true believer, but I have one concern. And it's, uh, it kind of picks up on what Mark was saying earlier about um, having greater facility with maths. It's about how this stuff is actually taught, how computational thinking is taught to people um, at any level. And it strikes me that before we, we were talking about the automation of abstractions, we have to talk about abstractions in themselves. And it seems that there's like a, a set, you can separate out what you were calling um, symbolic reasoning or critical thinking or rational thought, logic, analytical philosophy, whatever you want to call it. You can separate that out from, you know, questions of implementation and, and the, the proper computery parts of computer science. Um, and, you know, just, I can only really speak from my own experience, but uh, from, you know, being educated in, in various other countries and from acting as a TA, people as far as I can tell, don't learn these things. You know, they can't make an argument. They don't know uh, about the meanings of words, what adjectives, the roles of nouns, and things like that. Um, they don't know Boolean logic, what have you. Um, and it strikes me that the danger is that if you, if you try to teach um, computational thinking straight away, you, you end up with, with, with a, a curriculum that's sort of tokenistic. And as you say in the paper, it ends up on the end of, of, of role, um, of rote, rote skills as opposed to fundamental skills. Um, so I was wondering, you know, it seems like there's a bit of a, a conceptual, if not a pedagogical gap between reading, writing, arithmetic, and then way over there, computational thinking. And I was wondering if you thought there's anything that has to be in between there before people can actually get to this point. Yeah, so that's a really good question. I think there's a, a deep point to his question, which is um, still, uh, I think trying to be understood, where do you go? By the computing community working with education scientists, cognitive science, and so on. Um, I have not satisfied with this laundry list, of, if you will, of abstractions that I listed because it still doesn't really get at sort of fundamental. It looks like a laundry list, right? And I think that's where we are right now in terms of computer science, what we understand, um, and what we can imagine teaching, um, I, it, I don't find it satisfying. And I think uh, this, is, this, is why, um, this is why I think about sort of the analogy to mathematics and how it is taken. So I don't know if you know this, but in mathematics, there's a whole research area on mathematics education. Um, Similarly, uh, if you remember how physics education started in the 1950s um, to be really, everyone was pushing physics because of Sputnik. Um, there's a whole research area called physics education and how you know, the four courses that you take as an undergraduate in physics, they're lined up for a reason that way. In computer science, we're nowhere close to understanding what this lineup of concepts might look like, um, let alone how it, as I was saying, line or matches how our progression of, under, of, of um, reasoning skills and capabilities uh, uh, matures over time. Um, so to me, this is a research question. To me, you know, I asked that challenge question of the computer science community, but in the back of my mind, I said, you know what, this is actually a research question. I think PhD students in education or PhD students in, you know, cognitive science could be using this as a driver for their theses um, because computer scientists don't know anything. They know the content. Um, and they know what the content is all about, but they don't understand these kind of, I would say, learning science um, concepts. Uh, and I have seen silly remarks made by computer scientists who, who think they know what they're talking about, and it just comes across a little superficial. Actually, as you push back into K through 12, I'm wondering what that starts to do to the sort of gender balance of computer science as a field, right? As you get people learning computing or computational thinking earlier, 
does that mean that computer science starts to have a more even balance in time, or? Well, that's certainly a hope. Um, I, the gender imbalance in computer science is a, worth a whole talk. Um, and obviously, when we try to promote computer science uh, to everyone, we really mean everyone, and we hope that the um, concepts and ideas and the ways of thinking are appealing to girls and boys. Um, that's probably also worth a PhD thesis or two, um, in looking at studying, studying like five-year-old girls versus five-year-old boys, and then looking at them ten years later. I, you know, I, I mean, I, I'm not a social scientist, so I wouldn't know actually how to set up this experiment. But you could probably figure out, you know, uh, yeah. Hi, um, my name is Emily. I'm a master's student in computer science here. And this is somewhat related maybe to the last question, but in a lot of computer science courses, there's this weed out mentality. Uh, say whether it's algorithms or programming languages or like even AP computer science can be like this. And I think that that's a really unfortunate educational philosophy and it's kind of, uh, I think it can be a bit of a threat maybe to this computational thinking. So I'm curious, as a computer scientist and advocate of computational thinking, what is your opinion on that and how can computer science educators change that? So th that's a, a very good question. And behind that question is what I call the image of computing. Um, for, for many years, probably still, there's an image of a computer scientist or computing which is kind of this geeky, nerdy, um, aggressive perhaps, or passive aggressive kind of personality. And uh, it t turns people off. Uh, it, well, for good reason, I guess. And so, but if you think about computer science as a, as a discipline and the concepts taught, and it, it, there's no reason for these concepts to be taught in a way that would turn people off. Um, um, and um, for, I would say, almost a decade, we have been trying to make progress on that. I don't know that we have succeeded. Um, I, I, I used to, you know, when I was at the National Science Foundation, um, I ran a program called Broadening Participation in Computing, and it was specifically targeting women, underrepresented minorities, and persons with disabilities, um, and trying to, in that program, um, obviously increase the numbers, but also change the image of computing. So both teachers and educators, uh, uh, teachers and students would, would project the field in a much more positive way. Um, again, it, it does, it, it starts from the culture of the place. It, you know, a, a place like Columbia, maybe it's, it's very, the engineering school I know is very competitive. Um, you probably have, I know my father used to teach a weed out course in electrical engineering. He was quite proud of it. So, I, it, you know, it's part of the culture, I suppose, of, of engineering disciplines. That, you know, it's, I don't have an easy answer to this one, but it's definitely a recognized problem that people have been thinking about for a long time. Um, I just wanted to bounce off of what Mark said about how a lot of kids are really good at using other people's interfaces, but not necessarily interrogating them. I was wondering to what extent you think the fact that um, so much of our technology is so comfortable and so easy to work with um, actually prevents us from engaging with it or thinking computationally, and if that's a problem, how we get over it. That's a really great question for me. Um, because of course at Microsoft we 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 <laughs> we strive really hard to make things easy for our users and we often get criticized. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, maybe we are inadvertently teaching people how to think computationally. <laughs> I hadn't even thought about that that twist there. Um, 
yes, you know, in the grand scheme of things, the IT companies are striving for what I called before natural user interfaces where, you know, you can speak, you know, use gestures, you don't have to type anymore, you know, you can make mistakes and somehow the computer, you know, spelling correctors, it's exact, can make, and computers figure it out and it's just easier to enter. And so then your question of, well, then that means uh, the humans and children and students will, will probe less, they'll be less inquisitive. Um, there's where I really think we can somehow in, in our teaching in say K through 12, um, have teachers who, you know, now that the student's familiar with this device, familiar with this interface, have the students, have the teachers somehow get the students to ask, well, how does it work anyway? Because if you just ask, how does it work? Then you reveal all the innards and all the intricacies and all the layers of abstraction. Um, so you just need the teachers to ask, how does it work? And this is true of any engineering discipline. You know, we take everything around us for granted. Every, everything you buy in the store is, someone designed that bottle. Someone chose those colors. Someone designed those chairs that way. Someone put this building up and it's standing. Actually, most children in K through 12 do not ask the question of, you know, how, how come the bridge stands up? You know, you, you, that, uh, that's going to be a future civil engineer, right? So it's not just computer science, but it's in any of these kinds of engineering um, disciplines because, again, in, in K through 12, students are not exposed to engineering the way they are to science. So you don't, you know, you, you don't have, we, we in engineering have this problem, whereas little children are taken on nature walks, and so they ask questions about the things they see on the ground or uh, around them. Or they look at the stars and say, you know, how far away is the sun? <laughs> so it's, it's harder in, and so engineering, at least you can see, you can see a bridge and say, oh, well, how is that bridge standing up? In computer science, so much is in software, you can't really see too much, but you do have the device, and then you can start asking, well, how does that all work anyway? I mean, the, my favorite example from a long time ago was those little music players where you can fit, you know, I don't know how many megabytes or gigabytes now, but like, how do all those songs fit in that little device anyway? You know, can, can we get children to ask those kinds of questions? And then we can start the conversation. Uh, thank you, Doctor, for uh, coming to here today and addressing um, you know your, your your issues here in a wonderful way. I, I guess um, the the first thing is I, I I I'm very disappointed that Columbia is not promoting um, uh, you know cross interdisciplinary inter, uh, learning. I was hired 16 years ago with the B school, the engineering school, and the J school in just that that very nature and. Um, and I know after a year I just left in utter frustration. And at least from my perspective, it was always about the professors not willing to, to um, uh, cross-pollinate. But I guess to your talk, doctor, and just to segue on, on this last question, um, we now have over 25 plus years where technology is out of a mainframe and into the hands of the consumer. And yet we really still have not seen the progress that you're alluded to, and this uh, young lady alluded to, and that is about the curiosity of exploring what those little ports do, other than plugging in things, and how you can expand that. And my thesis is that I think your brain is wired that way. And I point to children on the autistic spectrum, and um, later, now we have further research to show that uh, a lot of the guys and, 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 and women in Silicon Valley uh, would fall on the autistic spectrum, or uh, how an engineer would look at a problem. So I guess my question is, isn't there just a natural selection where your brain is um, really wired to look at something, and then trying to use that and to strengthen that as opposed to trying to jam down 
the kids through K through 12 in a very uninteresting um, course of study for most of them. Mm -hmm. uh, let me, let me uh, see if I understand your question because I think, I thought you were making two points. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to interpret the last point about autistic engineers in Silicon Valley. Right. Uh, yeah, uh, I guess they, they've shown that, uh, in fact, in Norway, they are actually uh, identifying children who are on the spectrum and to use them in um, tasks that are more combinatorial. Okay, and so then I think that, so I, let's, let's pretend, let's, let's assume that is true. Yeah. And then your implication is that, I think, I thought the other point was then, and these are the people who are designing the contraptions, the technology that we use every day. No, no I, I, I no. meant that about brain structure. Oh, okay. That why, why people who might be interested in why a bridge stands up and why there are other people that really don't care. This, uh, speaking to you, right. this I think also, to me, it would be a fascinating you know, set of PhD theses because um, I've become recently very interested in, in neuroscience and the brain, and I actually don't know anything about this, but I'll just say this. And one wonders if there are certain kinds of brains wired for certain kinds of disciplines. Um, and so this is really partly your question. I, of course, don't know the answer to that but I think it would be very interesting, much like people have studied, maybe not at the neural level, but maybe, I, I, again, I don't know, um, people who, are, who tend to be good at math are also good at music. And so one wonders, no, I don't think anyone has studied, you know, what is, what is someone who is good at computer science, what does their brain look like? Is it more like a mathematician or a musician, or is it more like, I don't know. Uh, and so, so that's why I said it'd be interesting set of PhD theses there. But I think this, I, I think it's a very interesting question. I, I don't know about the correlation. I don't know about the study that you refer to about autistic brains, um, but I think this is, interesting question. I think it's also maybe interesting just the, the, the ways in which one starts to reason. So, you know, because we can do a brain scan, maybe we can correlate, maybe we can, right? There's like a line of, of reasoning that measurement and computation leads you down, which is yeah. this sort of interesting right. question. But let's have one last question and then I'm happy I to, apologize. I know it's over time, so I'm happy to take yeah. it. Uh, just one well, last Okay, question. all right. Um, so I'm a mathematician actually, and um, I, in fact, for whatever reason, interviewed someone who wrote the Common Core Curriculum for Mathematics today. So I spent an hour talking about um, curriculum for high school kids in mathematics, and, you know, he talked about um, a lot of the issues you brought up with respect to getting teachers that are qualified and teaching the craft as well as the facts, the laundry list issue. Um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you a provocative question, which I hope you don't take badly. I, I have an answer to it myself, but I'd like to hear yours. How is what you're describing not just a really good math curriculum? Because when you say, oh, we don't need algebra, trig, calculus, but we do need symbolic manipulation, I would counter that that's just really good algebra. Mm -hmm. So what you're saying is, let's be, and I, I would also say, since I'm a mathematician, that, um, and I'm biased, that if you want to be a really good programmer, become a mathematician, first, because then you get to learn to think the right way. So my question is, how is this not just a sort of um, idealistic mathematics curriculum? So I, I'm glad you asked this question, because I, uh, first of all, I, I, I was, who was I talking to earlier today? Um, oh, 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 let me just ask, answer your question. Um, I think that there are, um, uh, there are some differences in what you would teach in kind of the mathematical thinking for a computer scientist that I suspect mathematicians might not agree with. Um, and that is a very, uh, there are two points. 
One is um, operationalizing things. Now, maybe in mathematics, in fact, I'd like to think in mathematics, um, many procedures and, and algorithms um, are taught. They're just not called algorithms and they're not called operationalizing. So when you think about teaching um, uh, long division, for instance, that's just an algorithm that we teach. We just never use that term. So I do think in that respect, well, it's kind of an idealized math curriculum where we're actually using some computational terms to explain the general process. In fact, the fact that you want to just divide one number in, into the other and get a quotient and remainder, there might be many different methods to do that, different algorithms to do that. And so there's an opportunity there to, I guess, make the math curriculum even more ideal in, the, in your respect. Um, but I, I don't know that most math curricula embrace that kind of procedural, uh, explicit procedural thinking. Um, if so, that's great. The other difference I see is what I alluded to earlier, which is the constructive thinking. So maybe it's related, where rather than in math you would say there exists a function that satisfies certain properties. In computer science, you construct that function and then you prove the properties hold of that function. That is the more, so yes, there exists, but it's not good enough to prove the existence. You actually want a tangible example of that. And so that, that is much more aligned with you know, what, what you do on a kind of a daily basis in computer science. Now, in an idealized mathematics curriculum at the K through 12 level, if that were added to, if those two kinds of operationalizing and constructive thinking were added, then I'd be happy. <laughs> um, and I think that's probably, um, you know, Mike, I, I don't know what the current math curriculum looks like, um, but my guess at that is that there are opportunities um, for those two kinds of thinking, if you will, to be integrated or incorporated or, you know, added in some way. Um, I do think that mathematical thinking is fundamental to computational thinking, um, but, I, but I also think that there's more. I guess there's a third point, just to be co complete. Um, in computer science, we worry a lot about the edge cases. Um, even though we might say for all x colon int p of x, we know in reality that it's not for all integers. This p is not going to hold for all integers because there's actually a finite number of integers that are represented in this computer. And so we worry a lot about those edge cases where it may be de-emphasized in, in a, a pure math um, curriculum because it's, you know, it's, it's messiness. Um, in mean, computer science, you have to deal with those, those edge conditions. Yeah. All right, Jeanette, thank you so much. Um, thank you to the Tau Center for hosting us and to Nick for bringing us together tonight. And thank you all for indulging us for a few extra minutes. Thank you. Thank you.